Okay, here we go. So good uh, afternoon to everyone. My name is uh, Fernando Gont, and I will be doing an update on uh, three different ITF publications really, really quick. Uh, the first one is RFC uh, 1996 on uh, Slack renumbering events. Uh, it's a document that was published by the V6 Operations uh, Working Group that we co-authored with a number of folks that we that are actually uh, you know in this very meeting. So, as a kind of uh, very brief introduction about what this document is about, uh, let's you know talk about uh, you know a typical uh, you know home IPv6 home deployment scenario where you have you know your CPE router. Uh, the CPE router does DHCP version 6 prefix delegation with the ISP, and it does, for example, Slack on the local network. Well, one thing that, you know, quite frequently happens is that, you know, one way or another, for example, the, you know, the CPE router, you know, is, um, you know, reboot, and, you know, it comes up again, but you get a new prefix from, from the ISP without the local systems, you know, knowing about it. So essentially, one way or another, we get into renumbering scenarios where the CPU router, you know, gets renumbered, but the local nodes actually don't get to know about it. And of course, uh, you know, you get into connectivity problems. So there has been a lot of work in the IETF uh, in this area. For some reason, for some people, uh, it was kind of like controversial, but, you know, still we managed to, you know, get some useful work in this area. So this document, RFC 1996, is essentially a requirements document for uh, customer edge routers, meaning that if you have RFPs, uh, these might be the right document to look into. So I will try to very briefly summarize what are the requirements, okay, that have been introduced by, by this document, by this RFC. Uh, the first one, it requests or requires uh, Customer edge routers not to automatically send the HCP version 6 release messages when rebooting. And if you wonder why, well, the thing is that in uh, for some devices, when you uh, reboot the device, they automatically send one of these messages, which obviously cause that you know when the device comes up again, they get a new prefix, you know, from your from the ISP. So essentially, you know, automatically sending the HCP release messages introduces. Uh, you know, a renumbering event. So the idea is to, you know, try to avoid that. Second, and, you know, third requirement, if you wish, which are essentially the same, the idea is that the option lifetimes that you use on the LAN side must never span past the, you know, received lifetimes on the one side. So, for example, if you receive a prefix, you know, on the one side via, you know, uh, the HCP version 6 delegation, and the lifetime is of, let's say, one day, then the lifetimes that you announce on the uh, LAN side should never be uh, larger than one day, okay? Because otherwise, um, you might be renumbered, you know, in between. You might not be able to, you know, for example, renew that prefix, and that would, again, introduce a renumbering event. Uh, more requirements, and this is kind of like, you know, challenging, depending on, you know, what kind of device you're talking about, or actually for many devices, uh, you know, one of the, the problems here is that, for example, when a, a device is reboot, uh, it has no idea about the prefixes that the device was using, you know, before, before the device uh, was reboot. So the idea here is that, you know, to the extent that is possible, if that is possible, the device uh, should store the DHCP list information on stable storage. And when the device comes up again, you know, if it can, uh, you know, it uh, realizes that um, a renumbering event has occurred because, you know, the device got a new prefix via the DHCP version six prefix delegation, different from the one that it was using before, then, you know, it means that things have changed and, you know, the local nodes, the, the you know, devices on the LAN side uh, should be signaled about this condition. Um, obviously, um, you know, much of the you know, discussion or the description that I'm doing here uh, is being focused on a typical, you know, IPv6 home scenario, but this actually applies to many other scenarios. It's just that the home scenario is like, you know, well known to everyone. And, you know, it's probably the scenario where this kind of event happens, uh, you know, the, the most on a regular basis. <clears throat> And uh, now the final requirement is that um, we should probably employ, or the, the, actually the requirement is to employ more appropriate lifetimes for Slack options. 
So what we argue in the document is that um, you know the the C, uh, customer edge router should use a preferred uh, limit of 45 minutes. So that means the preferred lifetime should never be larger than 45 minutes, and the valid lifetime should never be larger than 90 minutes. This doesn't mean that, for example, addresses should change that often, but this actually means that if they are not refreshed, they should actually you know expire and eventually be removed. So essentially, this thing of you know employing um, uh, smaller lifetimes uh, means that if you face this kind of you know renumbering scenario, at least the period of time during which you experience connectivity events is going to uh, you know be uh, you know much shorter. Uh, okay, so that's it for uh, you know the Slack renumbering events. The you know second document that I'm going to briefly describe is RFC uh, 1998 on the implications of IPv6 extension headers. Um, this is again a document that I, you know, uh, I worked for, uh, you know, quite a long time with some of the guys that you know are, you know, uh, participating in in this meeting. It's a topic that, for some reason, you know, has been controversial, uh, you know, at the ITF, but not so much, you know, on operator forums where I think that we are all on the same page. Um, so as a kind of very brief introduction, we all know that, you know, um, you know, IPv6 changed the, you know, the packet structure of IPv, uh, of IP packets. And, you know, instead of having, you know, a variable length uh, header, you know, where you can put, you know, your options, um, you know, IPv6 uses a different structure, uh, essentially where you have a mandatory IPv6 uh, header of fixed size, and then you can, you know, insert, uh, you know, a variable number of extension headers, and then you can finally include the, you know, the, the payload, if you wish. Now, there's a problem with this uh, packet structure. Uh, probably it comes from the fact that, you know, when IPv6 was designed, the type of devices uh, and the architectures that were employed to process packets were uh, quite different from the ones that we are employing today. So at the time, they were mostly uh, based on uh, general purpose uh, CPUs, okay? <clears throat> Now, this packet uh, structure make it, makes it uh, much more difficult to you know, obtain or process layer uh, for information. Uh, for example, you know, obviously, if you need to access the, the payload, you will have to jump over each of the extension headers. And uh, you know, as a result of that, devices generally have like problems you know, in, in two different areas. One is a limit on the number of processed uh, headers. That means that there are devices that you know cannot jump, uh, you know, through so many different extension headers, and another one which is probably much more common is the fact that you know for uh, many architectures, uh, devices when processing packets they can only pick into a certain number of bytes, okay, of a packet. So that means that you might have a router that it's you know it can you know um, uh, process a packet as expected. If all the IPv6 extension header chain, uh, it's in the first, let's say, 64 uh, bytes or maybe 128 bytes, but uh, they might be unable to process the packet as expected. If you have, let's say, uh, you know, uh, 512 bytes of extension headers in between, um, this is a problem. Uh, you know, a problem that uh, has been discussed in the ITF for years now, probably almost 10 years, if I remember correctly. Um, and it has been controversial in, you know, uh, ITF circles, whereas on the other hand, I guess that op on operator uh, forums, you know, it's a, pro it's a problem that, you know, it was well known and, you know, everyone was on the same page. So what this document does, so essentially this document, this RFC that we publish uh, spells out, you know, what uh, many of you, many of us, uh, you know, knew for quite a long time. Uh, which means that you know this structure of IPv6 packets has a, a number of uh, you know negative implications, if you wish. First one is increasing the complexity of resulting traffic. And if you wonder, okay, why, why why do I care about that? Well, if you look at the number of vulnerability advisories that have been you know published in the last let's say five years uh, associated with IPv6, I would argue that uh, you know a fair share of them, if not most of them. Uh, are associated with the processing of uh, IPv6 extension headers. You might argue, you might argue uh, well, but you know that doesn't have to do with IPv6 itself. That's just like you know, 
uh, sloppy code, and you might be you know right about it, but at the end of the day, you know, for the folks running networks, uh, you know, the idea of having to process extension headers means that uh, you might be, uh, let's say, opening your network uh, to vulnerabilities that if um, you somehow could get rid of these extension headers, you know, you might, you know, you might avoid. Um, second implication uh, associated with the complexity of traffic is that it's difficult to obtain a process layer for information by intermediate systems like routers or any other kind of middle box. Again, here is the same thing. Uh, you might be an operator, for example, having to implement filters um, for distributed denial of service attacks, uh, in which case it, uh, you, you might have to you know, obtain the layer for information you know, and, and decide whether to um, allow or drop the packets as a result of that information. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are many devices that uh, uh, um, you know find it challenging to obtain this layer four information, where uh, you know when the packets employ extension headers. So this is you know problematic for those scenarios. Um, for uh, different architectures, you know the use of IPv6 extension headers might have uh, a negative performance impact. Um, you know, the reason for that is that there are some devices that when they are unable to, um, you know, process these pack or packets in general on the fast path, they might want to, you know, throw the packet, you know, on the slow path. And, you know, the implications of that is, you know, quite, quite obvious. Um, at the end of the day, if you wonder, okay, what's, what's the result of all this is that um, <clears throat> there are many operators that are already, um, dropping packets that uh, employ IPv6 extension headers. And this means that, uh, you know, their use is actually, you know, unreally able in the public internet. Uh, on the other hand, for, uh, I'd say like, a, except with, with, a, you know, ex, with a few exceptions, um, IPv6, IPv6 extension headers are not really, uh, let's say employ or necessary on the on the public internet probably the only two use cases might be fragmentation and ipsec um, but otherwise they are not really employed or used nowadays uh, so that is you know another you know factor or aspect that um, essentially um, leads operators to you know drop packets that employ um, extension headers <clears throat> this you know as a side comment uh, all this work was probably problematic because there was some specific work at the ITF that relies on uh, IPv6 extension headers. So I guess that for some people, anything uh, that could be considered as you know, negative when it comes to IPv6 extension headers was a, a no-go. So that's probably the reason why this work was you know, uh, controversial within the IETF and it took such a long time to, you know, to get published. And the final one is... Um, you know, uh, RFC 8981, which is essentially an update on uh, IPv6 temporary addresses. So I will, you know, without getting into details, I will try to uh, just focus on the changes that uh, have been introduced by this RFC. Obviously this is, uh, you know, um, a revision of RFC 4941, known as, you know, privacy extensions for Slack and so on. So changes. Uh, first change is that each temporary address that is, you know, produced with this, uh, you know, with this uh, updated uh, algorithm uh, will employ a different randomized uh, interface ID. If you look at RFC 4941, if you are using uh, different prefixes on uh, a local network, all of the temporary addresses or the temporary addresses for each of those prefixes will employ the same interface ID. Obviously, that allows for activity, co you know, correlation. So um, there is an update in 8981 um, that says that every uh, temporary address should use a different interface identifier. So that's one thing. Second update is that now addresses are renewed at uh, randomized interval intervals. If you look at uh, RFC 4941, uh, they are the, the temporary addresses are uh, you know updated or uh, recycled, if you wish, at um, you know regular time intervals, which you know could allow an attacker or anybody that you know wanted to uh, perform network activity uh, you know correlation to infer that you know 
the new address that you know it's uh, yeah, that we can see now, it's actually you know the new uh, or the replacement for the previous address that we were seeing. So uh, with 8981, uh, temporary addresses are now uh, renewed with randomized intervals. Uh, another thing that we did is to change the default uh, uh, default lifetimes. Okay, if you look at 49, 41, uh, uh, off the top of my head, uh, it uses a preferred lifetime of one day, but a valid lifetime of seven days, meaning that you could be using the same address for you know for a whole week. So what we did is you know to change this second value to change the maximum valid lifetime to two days. Meaning, uh, in the worst case scenario, you're only going to be using a temporary address for two days. This means that, you know, with some rough math, uh, the maximum number of concurrent addresses is going to be three, as opposed to the, you know, seven addresses that you normally have with RFC 4941. Okay. <clears throat> More changes, or the last couple of changes uh, stable addresses are not required. If you look at RFC uh, 4941, it implicitly or maybe even explicitly require that uh, temporary addresses be configured along with the stable addresses. And what we say in RFC 8981 is that stable addresses are not required. So, for example, if you have a mobile device, you could simply just configure uh, temporary addresses and no stable addresses. And, uh, you know, the final requirement is that temporary addresses are enabled by default which this is something that uh, you know was already happening in practice like you know most uh, you know uh, popular uh, you know operating systems were already enabled temporary addresses by default but that uh, you know wasn't reflected in uh, 4941 which said that you know they should be disabled by default so in this regard what we did is to align the uh, specification of temporary addresses with uh, you know, the, the, the common practice when it comes to, you know, host operating systems. So uh, that's it for the, you know, for the, those three documents. These three documents were, you know, published uh, earlier this year. So we have some time for uh, questions and comments, hopefully. Thank you, Fernando. Um, there's a one question, at least in the chat from Marcus, if you want to have a, a look at that. Yeah, let me see. Okay, chat. I can see it. I can have. Uh, so the question says, uh, does uh, RFC 8981 having you know a maximum uh, a, a maximum lifetime of two day of two days, meaning that I can have uh, sessions longer than two days, like for the uh, SSH case? Yeah, that is that is true and that is correct. But the thing is that um, you know or our 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 argument is that. If what you want are long-lived sessions, like for example SSH, then you shouldn't be employing temporary addresses for that. Now there is a challenge in there that uh, you know there's like a, a, a missing gap or there's like a gap uh, in that we don't have uh, in practice APIs that allow applications to select what are the you know the type of addresses that they want. Okay, uh, so for most cases, you know. Applications are unable to say, okay, I want stable addresses, you know, instead of, uh, you know, temporary addresses, because this is going to be, you know, an SSH session. You know, if you ask me, I would say that, um, you know, uh, it, it might be annoying for that case, but at the end of the day, it might also be annoyed, you know, probably equally annoyed or similarly annoyed if your sessions are, you know, reset every seven days. Um, so for that scenario, probably my, uh, my, my suggestion would be to somehow make SSH use stable addresses, which might mean for that case to disable, uh, you know, the temporary addresses. <clears throat> okay, and there's a little follow up there, Fernando. Just yeah, quick. yeah, the and next question we'll is, is, uh, is there an unambiguous way to identify that a given IPv6 address is a temporary one? No, not at all. Because essentially, uh, you know, if, if you look at current standards, we have, you know, two, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, uh, interface ID configuration for Slack. So there's 8981, the one that I have just discussed, and there is uh, RFC uh, 70, 7217, uh, which also randomizes the interface ID, but for stable addresses. So 
for any system that you know use the you know the latest uh, specifications in both cases both for stable addresses and for temporary uh, addresses you know, the interface id will be uh, you know random equally random so not possible to you know to 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 tell which of the two uh, you know which of the addresses are temporary and which ones are stable 